chapter 8. John chapter 8, I'll begin with verse 21. We didn't get as far as I thought we would this morning, and so we were a little over, so I'll try to really make this um, as brief as possible. But Okay, verse 21. He said, therefore, again to them, I go away, and you shall seek me, and you shall die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Therefore the Jews were saying, Surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, You are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. I said, Therefore to you, that you shall die in your sins. Notice there's that sins plural. Um, or <clears throat> For unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So unless you believe, so that's the stipulation, okay? And so they were saying to them, who are you? And uh, you remember that song by the who? Who are you? Who? 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 And they're, they're really freaking out. What, what's, what's Jesus doing here? Is this guy? They're not totally figuring him out yet. And they're asking who he is. They, I think they know in their heart. But Jesus said to them, what I have been saying to you from the beginning. Now, I just want to pull this out. In Ray Stedman says in the Greek, in that saying where he says, what I have been saying to you from the beginning, says it's a little firmer in the Greek when you read it out of the Greek, and it has, has this connotation like um, it's, it's direct and firm, and it says, I am absolutely and fundamentally what I have told you all along. That's what he's saying. It. I'm absolutely everything I've said I would. I've been telling you, and it's like you're not listening. So it's a very firm statement, and you'll find Jesus as we venture through the book of John becoming a little more firm and a little more blunt with, uh, with them because they're becoming, becoming more and more antagonistic after the festival of, of tabernacles. Um, they become a little bit more antagonistic with Jesus, and they, you know, they, they poke at his virgin birth, and he, he really calls them down on the carpet said, hey, you know, you guys are liars, and your dad's a liar, your father's a liar. And so he calls them, and so we see this antagonism really, really kind of stepping up a little. Verse 26, I have many things to speak to you and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. The things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They do not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So he, they weren't sure that he was talking about God the Father. They're not sure what he's saying here. Jesus therefore said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Um, that's a direct reference to the cross. But the word I am there, all the way through this chapter, it's mentioned. The word I am is ego imi. Okay, and ego imi means I, means I am. When God referred to his name in, in um, actually it's Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses said, who should I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am sent you. And so really this is what Jesus is saying. He's not just saying, I am he. He's saying, ego mini, I am, I am the I am. I, like I am Tom Camp. Um, I, Joe is Joe Whitchurch. God and Jesus is I am I am. Got that. It's pretty powerful. I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things that as, as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things pleasing to him. Wow. That is a pretty heavy statement. I always do. And would to God, would that be our heart? Lord, is in everything I do, am I pleasing you? And he didn't say some things or part, part of the things. He said, in everything I do, I please you. Can we arrive that to that place in our life? I think we can strive for it. Then he says in verse 30, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So a couple times, many came to believe him in this chapter. Of course, in 7, it was the same thing. But we're talking about the gospel here, okay? And the gospel now is take, taking the cutting edge and has become a little bit more firm, the Lord is. In the gospel, I, I, I listened to one of the guys speak on this, and he had some interesting things to say, but, he, but I, I can't do any better in words what he did. Whatever the gospel or wherever the gospel goes, no one remains the same. It draws and repels. It softens, it hardens. It both unites and it divides. But wherever the gospel goes forward, 
Nothing remains the same. <clears throat> Humbled or offended, either converted or remain conceited. The middle ground is almost always removed. People are pushed to the edges, either one extreme, one extreme or the other. No one remains the same. The gospel is really being put out there. We understand it in its power. There is no middle ground. It's like, well, um, I, I'll, you don't want to leave a service where the gospel is being uh, preached, and you can think, well, I'm not sure if I want to receive Jesus. I think it gets so in your face when we get the gospel that we have to make a decision, that all that middle ground is going to be gone. And I don't know where you are this morning, but if you're still trying to decide whether you want to follow Jesus or the gospel's for you, we're going to close the gap a little more because Jesus is the only way. He is the great I am. He is God in the flesh. And so we, we know that. And you know, uh, the world is, get, again, hating. It's not Democrats and Republicans or liberals and conservatives, guys. It's good and evil. And I know that sounds like a broad swipe, but that's where we're at. It's just good and evil. And what's happened is Jesus, and, and as believers, you're going to be hated more and more and more. Uh, so I'm glad you came to service to hear that. I guess I'm going to be hated. <laughs> but this should, uh, I want you to ammo up, guys, and, and, you know, man up, men, that this is time for us to stand. And we see, as a result, the world is mad. Everybody's mad at somebody. And there's so much hatred. It's because Jesus is drawing the line. And we're going to see that more and more evident. The hatred we see today, it's a result of, it's dividing our nations, plural, not just our, our nation. So again, the crowd at the Festival of Tabernacles, we, we just left, he left that in chapter 7, are becoming more and more antagonistic. And yes, that'll happen in our world. By the time we get to verse 21 of chapter 8, guys, Jesus is using more and more firm and blunt language with the crowds. Um, the people are, are not remaining on the fence. He's really calling them off the fence here. You are of your father, the devil. Now, you know, tell us how you feel, Jesus. You are of the father, the devil, and he's a liar, and you're liars. And he does it firm, but, but, I, but lovingly. But again, the more antagonistic and aggressive the world gets, guys, we need to be more frank and honest with our enemies. It's time to, it's like, no, we don't want you to come in as a drag queen to our schools and teach our kids about morals. We don't want CRT to come into the schools. We don't want that to be there. We don't want your morals. It's time to say enough's enough. That's it. We don't want you coming in and dictating to our kids that they can be gender neutral or they can get, um, you know, castrated. Uh, guys. When is enough enough? It's now. Enough's enough. So we need to stand up for what God has told us to stand up for. We need to be honest. To push back, guys, we need to push back and be firm, but still be loving, right? There's a balance there. Now, he starts with this verse. He said to them again, again to them. So he's talking to them in sequence of the last um, verse 12, again, therefore Jesus spoke. So he's kind of going in sequence. He said, I go away. Let's just stop where. Now, when he's saying, I go away, you, he's telling them, you can't come with me. In fact, in John chapter 7, verse 34, he said, you shall seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And he says the same thing in 36, and where I am, you cannot come. So I labeled this sermon, um, seek and you shall die. The plight of the seeker generation that that jesus is saying you are going to seek and there are two kinds of seeking there's true seeking and there's false seeking and he said your seeking is going to put you in hell i go away and you shall seek me and and notice he says you, you shall seek me now the bible says that none seek after god right no not one that's true I believe that verse, but I don't believe it like the Calvinists do. I believe it that nobody can come to God unless the Father draws him, come to Jesus, and he draws everybody. There is not any particular person he won't draw. So we know that we don't seek after God, and any time I go after God, it's because he's laid it on my heart to go after him. 
It's because he's put it on my heart to be, be uh, seeking him. But he's telling them, you will seek me and you shall die in your sin. You shall die in your sin. We know that sin kills. In fact, James tells us that when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. That we begin with this lust thing and we go on and on. So sin separates us from God. That's the gospel, guys. That's, so if you come to hear the gospel, that's part of it. It's simple, it's true, and it's, it's in our face, if you will. So it's, and then where I'm going, you cannot come. And like, notice what he says that, and they, they repeat it. He said where I'm going, where you cannot come. Well, the Jewish um, rabbis taught that if you were a Jew and you um, committed suicide, you would go to the darkest place of hell. There's a place in hell that is just for people that kill themselves. This is what the Jewish people think. It's kind of like we do believe there's compartments in hell from the book of Jude, right? There are places that may be a little hotter than others. False teachers, look out. You're going to be heated up. But, but this is what they believe. Now, I don't necessarily believe that when someone commits suicide that they're bound for hell. I don't believe that. I believe that it depends on the state of their heart and where they are with God. And the only sin that's unforgivable is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only one. And so some people have been brought to the point where they wanted to kill themselves. And again, what, what, and I'm not going to speak too much on this because it's a really dicey topic. But I have to know, I know one thing, that there's only one thing that sends us to hell. It's the total rejection of Jesus. You know what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is? Is that you deny Jesus, you know he's real, and you've seen him work, and you say, don't want part of it. You have to actively say that, you actively have believed that he's true, and then you have to actively just say, I don't want any part of that. And that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Rarely does that happen. If you're worried you've done that, well, guess what? You're not, you've not done it. Because <laughs> the very fact that you're worried that you've done it means that you didn't do it. <laughs> And I used to be, when I first got saved, like, oh, man, what if I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Ah! And I found out that, you know, it's, it's a very conscious effort to do that. So he says, <clears throat> so he, that's what he says, therefore the Jews say, surely he will not kill himself. So that's why they thought we, that he was saying, when I die, I'll go to this, this dark part of hell. I won't see anybody. I think it was a stab against his deity. They just kind of took the knife in and went, eh. Will he really just kill himself? And you'll find him, they're poking at his um, virgin birth and his deity, and they're trying to antagonize him to say, like, pulling things out of the hat. So, so you say, um, since he says where I'm going, you cannot come. 23, he was saying to them, you are from below, and I, and I am from above. The, um, you are of this world, and I'm not of this world. From below, basically, he's talking about here on this planet Earth. He's actually talking about a certain place below, not below the Earth, but we're, we're from below. We're not, and you know when you're born again, you know, that's what that word means, born from above. Did you know that? Born again in the Greek means born from above. These people have not been born again. They're born, they're, they're from below, and Jesus is from be, uh, above, and we'll get into that. And then he says, I'm not of this world, you're, you know, I'm not of this world, and you are. I know in John chapter, I think, 1 John chapter 5 <clears throat> says that basically that do not love the world nor the things in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, the lust of the eyes is not from the Father but is from the world. So that's what it means to be of the world. And so two things, they will, they will not seek God for two reasons. They're from below and they're of the world. And so that's the strikes against them. And this is, this is what he's telling them. Now, <clears throat> verse 25, and so they were saying to him, who are you? We'll go back to 24. I said, therefore, to you, you shall die in your sins. Now, 25, this is where he says, who are you? And I believe they're asking, you know, who do you think you are? We are God's children. We're Abe's, Abraham's kids. Who do you think you are telling us that? In fact, they really started poking back when he says, um, where's your father? Verse 19, 
this is a part of that sequence that they're really, they're poking at the virgin birth when he says, where's your father? Because the, the, um, there was a, at that time, uh, it was a rumor that Mary had gone to bed and had relations with the Roman soldier, and that's where Jesus came from. Of course, that's blasphemy. But they could not reconcile the fact that Mary miraculously conceived Jesus. So they poke at that. But then they say, who are you? Jesus asked his disciples, remember, who do men say that I am? And they're saying, well, one says you're the prophet. One says you're John. One you're some of the prophets. And, and they're kind of batting it around. And then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? Who do you say? And Peter made, came up with that great confession. You are Messiah. The one, I mean, he just gave this great profession of faith. How, who is God to you? Who is Jesus to you? Is he just someone that you come to church and hear about on Sunday morning and you believe in him and you believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, but, you know, you're not really seeking him and maybe you're not really following him? Who are, and then they're saying to him, who are you to demand of us this kind of respect? Who are you? Guys, this is the, Jesus is asking us to love him with our whole heart. And everything we have inside of us. Jesus said to them, what, I've been, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? In other words, he said, I'm absolutely and fundamentally what I've told you all along. I keep telling you. Remember he told his disciples, I'm going to die at the hands of the leaders and I'm going to raise again. And he kept saying it over and over and foot over their head, foot over their head. They don't even get it until the very last. That's weird. Sorry about that. I got hearing aids and it's hooked into my phone. And I can't hear it half the time going, where did that come from? These are new hearing aids, so forgive me. I was like, Mom, I told you not to call me. No. <laughs> so, <coughs> um, but yeah, this is what he's saying. is that, um, And then he goes on to say, hey, listen, I have many things to speak to you and judge concerning who he who sent me is true. The things which I have heard from him, these I speak to the world. Jesus didn't say anything that wouldn't be directly from the Father, anything at all. He said, the Father speaks to me, and now I'm speaking to you. This is really causing the Pharisees and the leaders to be really mad. They're hating him all the more. And that's what's happening in our world. Everybody knows how to work these phones. That's crazy. So, <laughs> but this is why the world, guys, is actually now, they're, they're hate, they hate Jesus. They hate you because they're being called on what they believe. It's not Democrat again and Republican, um, liberal and conservative. It's good and evil. And they don't like to be called out as evil. And this is where we're at in our country. And I just pray that God will help us, guys, shore up what we really believe. Who are you, Jesus? Are you the everything you said you were? I mean, are you the King of kings and Lord of lords? Are you the one that, that saves our soul? Do I really believe that? Do I really, really trust you? And if the world just shakes from underneath us, can I put my faith in you with no food, maybe no electricity, no water, no car that runs? I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I, I'm telling you guys, I don't know where we're headed, but it's going to be tough times. He, in verse 27, they did not realize that he had been speaking about the Father. So they're kind of oblivious. I think they got a hint, but Jesus was talking about the Father. Jesus therefore said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Ego imi. I am he. He continues to use this language, I am. The world's looking for ways to substitute Jesus. That's what's happening, and we're trying to substitute, to substitute him. But he says, I am, and this, when I get lifted up, is with direct um, reference to the cross. And you notice what happens after that, that he spoke this and many believed. 
Anytime the cross is being clearly taught, the gospel is being taught along with the cross, and every time it's clear, people believe. They say, oh, I get that. And so when we hear about the cross, so he was referring when I get lifted up, and, and many of the Jews know what that, knew what that meant. And they're saying, hmm, he must be who he says he is. And have you really considered this morning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the very cross that he died on? Because that'll make a believer out of non-believers, which it does regularly. What do you really believe? Who do you believe? So I believe they're trying to substitute. Everybody's trying to substitute Jesus. They're seeking something other than Jesus. Everybody's trying to substitute Jesus with their own ideologies um, about Christianity and especially about Jesus. Where's your father and who are you? Where's your daddy? I think as we discover Jesus and rightly define who he is, we're better apt to share him with people, and it, and it, it shores up our faith. The more I know about Jesus, the more, more I know about his deity and his power, the more, more really the more um, firm I am, the more confident I am in sharing the gospel. I think sometimes we're, sheeping, we're, we're kind of sheepish and stand back from sharing the gospel because we really don't know how to define Jesus. The book of John defines him seven ways, really 14 ways. We've already had two of them. I am the bread of life. I am ego imi. I am God. And God is the bread of life. And he says, I am the light of the world. So, so far, that's the two I am's that we have covered in John. The rest of the five are I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the vine. How can you walk away from that and know that ego emi say, says that, that I am? Just someone, someone, someone says, hey, what, who sent you? Say, ego emi. Ego emi sent me. I am sent me to do his work. And there are seven signs or miracles. Not only are there seven I ams, but just, and if I were just to read the book of John, I wouldn't need the other gospels, and I do, don't get me wrong, so... But if I just were to read the book of John, there's enough evidence there in the seven I am's and the seven signs and miracles for me to put my faith totally in Jesus. Amen? In fact, um, <clears throat> when, you change, like, when you change water to wine, we've already learned that. Who does that? When we change, well, when he heals the nobleman's son, when he healed the pool guy at Bethsaida, when he fed the 5,000, when he walked on the water, those are things that he's already done. And here we are, we're not even through the book of John. I hope you're encouraged to know that you can believe and put all your faith in Christ. And you need to continue to seek him. Seeking does not stop at salvation. Our seeking goes on and on. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. What that means to really seek him. It means to follow him. To live for him. He had two more that were coming up. He healed the blind man and he raised Lazarus from the dead. He has all these truths. But notice what he says again in John 8, 12, John 8, 28, John 8, 18, and John 8, 58. And John 8, 58 says this. It doesn't get any better. Before Abraham was born, I am. That's powerful. Their jaws were dropping at that time. Well, you're not that old. How can you do that? And, and Jesus laying claim to be God. When he says, I go away, to, to go back that, um, he, basically, he says in John 16, 7, it's good for the believer that I go away. It's bad for the non-believer. That's why they can't come with him. But it's good for the believer because John 16, 7 says, it's to your advantage that I go because I will send to you the helper. I have to leave, but the helper cannot come until I am glorified next to the Father. So, he said, it's good for me to go. And the, the disciples are going, that's not good. We want to be with you. They were with him three years seeing all the miracles. But Jesus in his bodily form was not omnipresent. He, he laid that part of his deity down. He was, he was omnipresent. He was God. But the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, and therefore he does his work in all of us. And that's why he says, it's good that I go, because I go to the Father to make intercession, and I'm going to send you one that will help everybody. And that's the helper, the comforter. 
John 14, 20, um, 14, 28, and 29 says, I will come. You know, he says, I will go away, but I will come. And in my father's house, there are many mansions there. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place. I can't wait. You know, those of you guys who build homes, you know, it takes what? You know, a number of months to build a home. And a nice one takes a while. Jesus has been working on our house 2,000 years. Could you imagine what that's going to look like? He's preparing a place for us, and we're all going to... I, the, the whole idea of um, the mansions in heaven, it talks about it's like one house. We get it in the Greek. One, we're all going to be in one, one, just one big house with lots and lots of food. A big, big yard where we can play football <laughs> in my father's house. He's been working. Two, so look what he did in six days. 2,000 years with <laughs> living with him. I can't wait. That's why we want to go to heaven. People think we're nuts. No, we're not. I want to go to heaven. I'm ready. I'm so ready, but I'm, I'm going to go out kicking and screaming. But they say, but they're seeking God. So I just feel like it's interesting when we talk about seeking God. Um, people in AA seek God. They call him the God of their understanding. Now, there are some people that get saved through AA. And I'm thankful for those of you who are in AA that are pre presenting a witness there. But in their, ter in their purest form, they have strayed from what they started, and they're basically, you know, you can just choose whatever to be your high power, how, how your power is. Um, you can have be a doorknob, you know. It could be your grandma's dirty shoe. I don't know. Be anything. You, and, and basically, the AA is kind of giving a false gospel. They're seeking... For God, but it's not the same God that we serve. So those of you who are in AA that know the real God, don't shut up. Just tell them about it. The Mormons, they're, they're seeking a God, but think about it. The Mormons believe that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. So they went up to God, the Father, and brought a plan of salvation. Both of them spelled it out. They brought it out before the Father, and the Father took Jesus's. And it made Lucifer mad, and he threw him out of heaven. Huh? Where did that come from? <laughs> and the plant, so, so Mormons, they're seekers, but they're false seekers. Um, Jehovah Witnesses, they believe that Jesus was a God, not the, the God. Now, they have since renunciated some of that, but if you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They interpret the Greek that the word was a God, and that means everybody can become a God if you're a Jehovah Witness and you have different levels of heaven. So Jesus is not exclusively God, and Mormons don't believe that he's exclusively God. So they're cults. In fact, I look at the, the woke progressive church and what's happening and, and, and what's going on with them. And uh, um, it's just... I would say that it's becoming more and more progressively liberal, and they don't believe the Bible's inerrant. They don't believe, I mean, this is, they have different pockets. They will not come out and believe, tell you what they really believe sometimes. I hear interviews with them, and they say things, but um, they don't believe the word is inerrant, and it really is an option to believe in the resurrection. You know, you can believe in it, or you don't have to. You don't have to believe in the virgin birth. It probably didn't happen, and so what we're seeing is that people are seeking, but they're not finding, because why? They're going to die in their sin. Now, J.B. Phillips has a commentary, and we're going to give an example of what a seeker is and what happened with King Saul. Um, if you remember, King Saul was commanded by Samuel to go and kill all the Amalekites. Well, he didn't do that. It was in Samuel. He didn't kill them all, so they basically, um, and, and God told him to kill all the animals. So they saved the animals, Saul and all of his warriors, and they saved the king and didn't kill him. So Samuel comes up to the camp where they're camping, and he hears, <laughs> whatever you do that, a cow, you know, make a donkey sound. He's hearing all that, and he's going, what's that I'm hearing? He goes, and, and you know, Saul goes, well, I just thought we would save some of the animals so we can sacrifice them. And God told him to kill all the animals and to kill the king. 
And that's where we get the idea obeying is better than sacrifice. God wanted them all killed, even the animals. Now God has his reasons, and they didn't do it. And if you remember, King Agag was brought up, and, and Saul said, well, I saved him. And then Samuel hacked him up with a, with a sword. And he said, this day the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to another. And he was referring to David. And as Samuel was walking away, he grabbed hold of his robe, and it ripped. And he goes, that's what the kingdom's going to be to you, Saul. There's going to be ripped from you this day. You will not be king when David takes over. And it was the end of his kingship. Well, what, what happens is he's going to another war with the Philistines. But um, this is what happened. He's, this is J.B. Phillips. He sinned away the day of grace. And God's spirit thereafter left him to himself and to the mercy of an evil spirit. And if you remember, an evil spirit taunted him and he'd have David come pick a little for him. And, he, and he'd just all of a sudden take up a spear and throw it and chuck it at David. It's like Saul's got a spear and David's got a harp. And he's chucking spears at David because he's got an evil spirit bothering him. After, after Samuel died, you'll also know that Saul's history was ever increasing sin. But he sought for a word from God. He was confronted with a silent heaven. Should I go against the Philistines? Nothing. He was getting nothing from God. He went to a witch at Endor and knocked on the door of hell, hoping for some word from beyond to guide him in his distress. God simply opened the door and Saul walked through it to his doom. Did Saul make it to heaven? We don't know. Listen, there was a great grace poured out him at the very last, but, but Saul asked David or Samuel, to pray to his God, and he would ask him for favor so I could still be king instead of forgiveness. He was asking um, for forgiveness without repentance. There is a scary place to be. We want to be forgiven and clean and cleansed from what we do and how we live a lot and, and things that we, we know we shouldn't do. We want to be forgiven, and we want to be right with God, but there's no repentance. I don't know if we'll see King Saul in heaven. I really don't. Will we see him in heaven? And I, I, Erwin Lutzer, and I, I think in one of his commentaries, said he, he didn't know either. So a lot of your scholars, why take the chance? Obey God. And again, his chase of David, chasing David around with spears, chucking spears at him. David's playing the harp. A little bit of a contrast, wouldn't you say? So... I want to just kind of bring to you some ideas about true seekers. Um, and false seekers. First of all, what's a, a what's a true seeker? A true seeker. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, Seek things above, put treasures in heaven. You know. Our seeking is not over when we're saved. It's like, do we stop seeking God? No, it's a part of our sanctification. We're walking after him, being set apart all the while. We're to put our mind on things above. And I think we have that in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. And put, it, put all your affections on things above. In fact, Paul gives the elite eight in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is of good reputation, any excellent, any praiseworthy, let your mind dwell on these things. Our seeking now is turned into a different, it's a little bit different. We're seeking the things of heaven now. They cannot seek because they did not receive Christ as Lord. So how do we as believers seek the Lord? And I'm going to put a little, try to make this as practical as possible. What, what does it mean for us to seek God? It doesn't stop at salvation. Well, first of all, you need to spend time with Jesus. Very simple. Do your devotions. Are you doing your devos? Simply meaning this. Are you praying and are you reading? Are you spending time where God can speak to you? And if you're not doing that, you're not seeking God. And God, in fact, Jeremiah says, if they seek me, they seek me with their whole heart, I will hear from them. 
And so God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray every day. Now, we don't always get that done, right? And some of us will probably say, my prayer lacks. I hear that a lot. I say, how's your prayer life? And they say, well, it could be better. Or usually that means they're not doing it at all. Or just doing very, very little. And um, I've just noticed when I find my prayer life doing well, I, I tell I'm doing great in prayer life, you know. Terry and I have been trying to get up in the mornings and pray together. It's been great. But that is part of our seeking God. To read your Bible and read systematically through. I'm just going to give you some practical application. Read your Bible. Read one or two or three chapters every day. How hard is that? You listen to the radio or you watch TV or you sit down and eat for half an hour. Why not just read your Bible for a little, a little bit? I believe part of that also is personal study time. I have devotional study time. I think every believer, and I'm just going to just say this, ought to at least know a little bit about how to study your Bible. Get you a Vines, get you a Strong's, and, um, and get you a Thompson Chain Reference. That's my favorite study Bible. And you can, you can set the world on fire. Just, you don't have to be a scholar. Just read and study. Study the Word of God. That's seeking. Memorize the Word of God. How many of you guys memorized any verses as of recent? When I first got saved, it was like, dun, 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 dun. I was just chewing the word up. I was memorizing it. My brain was enveloped. I would memorize two a week for I don't know how long I did that. And God, that, that paid all kinds of spiritual dividends and awards, guys. That really, really bumped my, my, my spiritual life up. I began to memorize the word. I began to read the word. I began to kind of study the word. I didn't know what a Strong's and a Vines was, so I just went to the Webster's and found it. Some of the words later said, well, you can go Webster's, but there's one called Strong's. Oh, good. Spending time with Jesus is seeking him and fellowship. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, we are to fellowship. That is part of our seeking word, prayer, fellowship. Sound familiar? Evangelism. Something rings about that. That's what our Wednesday night group will be, is word, prayer, fellowship. We're trying to get that so we can all come together, and we're going to pray that night. We're going to have some word, and we're going to try to eat a meal. And we want to invite you all to come and be a part of that. It's just going to be really a thriving time for us to, to know one another. So we spend time with Jesus, number one. And I believe the other one, we, we do is that we evangelize. We need to share our faith. Jesus said when he was talking to the separation of the sheep and the goats, he, he said, you know, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in the hospital and you came to me. I needed clothes. You came to me. And they said, when did we do that? And Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And I believe part of seeking is that whole devotional life of, of um, sharing your faith. Share Jesus at work. Maybe some of you guys do. Now, don't forsake your work for sharing, but share Christ on the job. People, you know, there's no shortage of hurting people. So I don't know who to share with. Well, then... If you work out at the gym, I go to the gym, I work out, I get to share with guys there. I share with men, and they, if I wear a Jesus t-shirt, they say, hey, are you a Christian? Yeah, well, I've been thinking about it. And just, just share your faith, guys. At the grocery store, the lady is taking your money. Maybe you could just put a little word in for Jesus. You say, well, that's not me. No, that's not, not you. It's Jesus who wants to do that. At the convenience store, which I, I visit quite often, I'm a convenience store junkie. I've been known for that, and I'll stop at anyone I can. Well, we have one by our house on Heath Street, and it's sort of a low, I don't even know how to say it, but some people call it a ghetto VP. But a lot of people hang out there from the homeless shelter, and I go in, and I, I see them there, and sometimes they ask for money, or the lady at the, at the cash register, I say, how are you doing? And I get a share with them. I mean, they're out there. She hates her job, and she hates being in that store. She's afraid she's going to get robbed. 
I am too when I go in. <laughs> but somebody needs to tell these people. They walk the streets. If you just stop and, t and talk to someone, they, they might even respond to you. I don't know. No, I'm saying our day of just easy, easy peasy Christianity, I mean, we just kind of get along. I don't, need to do, I don't need to do a whole lot. Just make sure I get to heaven. I believe those days are over. I believe God's calling his church to stand up and share your faith. Follow Jesus, not just adore him. We all love him. We all sing his praises. But are you following him? And, and another one, I believe, as we seek, is discipleship. Part of our walk with the Lord is sharing our walk with someone else that is a Christian. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, These things are written to you, Timothy, that you can... Um, share it and teach other men so that they can teach other men. The whole idea of um, discipleship is this. You teach someone how to walk with the Lord and you're pouring your life into them. What happens is you teach them that they need to do that too, not just stop with them, but we teach people how to teach people. It's real simple, really. It's not that hard. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And how do we do that? How do, what's the practicalities of discipleship? Normally what happens is you find someone that you, you're good friends with or they're walking after the Lord and you're just feeling, hey, man, would you disciple me? I've had people ask me to disciple them, and a lot of times I'll pick it up and do it. I've always been able to, in my, and I'm thankful for this, to have people in my life that I've shared with. Who is your Paul and who is your Timothy? See, seeking God is actively doing his will. And so who is the person that you are accountable to and, the, and you're sharing your life and you can dump your heart out at, to them? Who is that person? Who is the Timothy that you're pouring your life into? See, it's not an option to disciple, guys. Jesus said in, 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 in Matthew, that go ye into the, all the world and what? Make converts of all men. No, make disciples of all men. Converts is just a natural when we live for Jesus. People will come to know him because they like what they see. I want some of that. <laughs> they want that. But we need to know, and who is your Paul and who is your Timothy? Guys, who are you sharing your life with? I know it's busy. We have a busy life. We have children. We have different things we got to do. But I'm speaking to the men now. Gentlemen, who is your Timothy? And who is your Paul? Are you teaching and training anybody? I, you know what I do? I get them in, and, and we, we had experience in God not too long ago with Adam and Josh McRoberts and some guys. And um, we went through experience in God, and they memorized two verses a week, um, Scripture memory, and we taught them how to do inductive Bible study. And, and I was able to share, and I've been able to do this through the years, pull them in and just say, hey, listen, why don't we just have a Bible study, and, and I will train you how to read God's Word and how to know God's will. I mean, they'll get that pretty easy. But that's part of discipleship. Well, I do that with my family. Of course. You'd be a fool if you didn't. But guys, God's called us more than just to our families. And I hope that doesn't, you know, strain anybody too much. But he's called us to, to help others. I love my family. My kids, when they, they were discipled, they watched Dad go to church every Sunday morning. They had to go every Sunday night. They had to go every Wednesday night. They had to go, and they had to sit in my Bible study Friday night. And, they, and, I, and I was thankful. And that's when I say God is good. God has been good to me. And my family now seems to be following. Well, they are following Jesus. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. I'm a blessed man. But I believe I, I was able to implement discipleship in my life and with other people. Spend time with them. I call it the hang-do approach. You hang with someone and you do something. Don't just hang with them and do nothing. I mean, hey, let's go hang. Or teach a Bible study with them. Or, or you know, you could go out and say, hey, I tell people, hey, you want to go to the hospital with me? Yeah. You want to go to the prison with me or to the jail? Yeah, I'll go. Do you, do you want to come with me to share on the bridge? We're going to go share on the bridge, guys. You want to come? You're more than welcome. We're just going, Joe and I are going to play some music and hand out tracks. You want to, and I, my fun, the funnest one is, 
funnest, is um, hunting and fishing. I love to hunt and fish with guys because I get to disciple them at the same time I'm getting a big catfish rolled in or I'm shooting that big buck and I'm, I'm, you know what, guys? There is fellowship in that. We do stuff with people. Always keep in mind that you can bring someone along with you. Um, I, riding a motorcycle, it's a ministry and we get to stop sometimes and pray and then we always get ice cream. There's a lot of fellowship over the ice cream. So when we're done with the ride or somewhere along the ride, we've got to get ice cream. That's, that's, that's the discipleship part of <laughs> riding Harley. But just do the hang and do thing, guys. Train them. Teach them. Do some formal training and some informal training with your life. Let them know who you are and that you hurt at times and you need their prayer. They need to know that you have feet of clay. And then another, one of the biggest ones, I think, that goes so neglected, just pray for them. Who's your Timothy you're praying for? Not just pray for someone sporadically, which is cool. That's good. But you got anybody you're saying, I'm praying till Christ is formed in them, that they walk in a manner worthy of Christ to please him in all respects, to bear fruit in every good work. And I'm not letting up on this prayer until I see that formed in their life. Pray for them, that they grow in the knowledge of Jesus and pray that they will disciple others. That's the key. You can disciple people, but it's got to be hand, hand in the baton. You're running a long race, guys. And I, I'm so thankful. I want to, when Jesus said here to verse 29, the shift to maybe just a moment, he says, I do all the things that please the Lord. You know, there's no such thing as secularization of the Lord's life. He didn't have a secular part and a spiritual part. He didn't divide it. Helping mom mop the floor or learning the Greek alphabet in school, guys, it was the same to Jesus. Or sawing a piece of wood to make a plow as the village carpenter or preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus looked at that as all the same. It was a ministry to his God. Raising the dead or weeping at Gethsemane, he saw it all as the same. Dying on a Roman cross or lying still in a cold de deathbed of Joseph's tomb. He didn't secular secularize his life. Everything was for the glory of God. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, no matter what it is, do it in, in, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and dependence upon him, giving thanks to God the Father. Everything I do should be under the scrutiny of God's word and it's his will. Well, I got a little, you know, we worship our leisure time. Sometimes I find myself like, I'll go to the easy chair, and flip on the news, and I'm just leisuring. <laughs> and I don't want anybody to call me. And sometimes we worship our leisure time, our recreation time. It all should, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't relax. I'm just saying everything we do, does it glorify God? I mean, I'm convicted, not everything I do. But when you hear a message like this and you hear what the Lord said, it challenges me to walk this out in a better way, doesn't it, you? Heaven's going to be a, a great place. And when we get there, guys, it's not going to be like, when we get there, man, I was really hoping that I would make it here. There'll be none of that there. We all, I know I'm going to heaven. And I'm not going to get up there and say, woo, just made it. Some people might, I don't know. I can't believe I made it. Or I heard a lot about this place and wow, I guess I was good enough to make it. You won't hear any of that up there. The gospel is meaning that we get to go one day live with Jesus. Man, I thought this place wasn't real, but look, it's real. No one's going to say that. We know what we're expecting. If you don't know that's what you're expecting, you really need to know today. I'm going to share a story with you. Um, I worked at a place called Carry Home, and we work with young men. And in particular, there was one young man that I had when I was there. And um, became sort of friends with him. I shared the gospel with all those guys there. They, they thought I was nuts. They said, man, Tom, you're really cool. Why are you a Christian? <laughs> Not like you weren't cool being a Christian, whatever. 
but I had a good rapport with a lot of the guys. And, and when I left Kerry home and started pastoring Harvest. And some years later, I had heard that one of those young men killed his mother. And there were some horrendous things around it. And he was in prison. And he was put in prison until about two years ago. And so he ended up in a place called Sycamore Springs. And a lady that works there called me and said, this, this guy wants to talk to you. He remembers you. I'm going, okay. So I went over there and I shared with him Christ. And I gave him the gospel. And he said, I wasn't ready. He said, I'm not really ready. And I was good with that. I wasn't going to force it. But he said, but I'm really interested. And I like, basically, basically saying, I like what I'm hearing. But I, I haven't made that cut yet. I don't know. I said, well, listen, you need help. You need to get out of Springs, and you need to go. So I uh, advised them to go to uh, Trinity, um, and then they accepted him at Trinity. And probably had been there for maybe a month and a half, two months, maybe longer, I don't know. Uh, but Friday night Bible study, M Mel just blessed me, Mel Razakowski. She, she said, I asked about this young man, and uh, she goes, oh, yeah. He gave us, he's fine. I'm going, what? Yeah, Stan Good came and spoke. If you know Stan Good, he was the one that really started, he and Rob Staley started the crossing. And Stan came and spoke to them, and Shane was in that meeting. And Stan gave this illustration about WD-40. Anybody heard of WD-40? Like, what is called water displacement, WD. The rocket, it was uh, this company, Rocket Chemical Company, and they set out to create a rust prevention solvents and degreaser, if you will. And they had 40 attempts, tried to make that thing right. You know, 25 times it's not right. I've 29 times it's not right. 35 times, and are we going to ever get it? On the 40th try, they invented WD-40, and it's the most, one of the most popular degreasers in Water displacement, whatever it is, it's like 40 times. Now, I would, after three or four, be done. That's it. I'm not doing any more. They went 40 times. Stan gave that illustration about Jesus as he's come. Is are you on your 40th time? If you're on your 39th or your 40th, listen, he, and so, so many people just say, well, I've come too many times, or I've, I've heard the gospel too much, and I, I can't really surrender my life completely over. He gave his life to Jesus Christ after that WD-40 illustration. He's, still, he's got the very can. Doesn't he have the can? He's got the WD can that, uh, that Stan used. Forty times, guys. Some of you have been in here a lot, and you've heard. And maybe, I hope you know Jesus. You've been hearing about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We want to close the gap of the gospel. Close that gap so there's no middle ground. That's one thing about the gospel. If you're hearing it in its entirety and its power, you either have to say, yes, I want it, or I reject it. What do you want to do? And I believe, and maybe some of you guys might be at a, at a crossroads with your walk with the Lord. You just don't, you've not been living for him. The gospel is, you believe it, but you've not surrendered. Or some of you guys have heard it for 40 times. But this could be the 40th time for some of you. That Christ loves you, and he will always reach his hand out to you no matter what you've done, no matter what, how far you've strayed, no matter what you feel, it, it, he loves you. You could be a WD-40 Christian today, <laughs> or one that seeks God, and you're, you're not seeking him like you should. It's time. It's time to push back against the world. We got something to believe in, guys. We have the truth. We have all that we need according to be a godly person, and some of you are not tapping into it. Now, as we close here, you can sit, let's all stand. If God has dealt with your heart in that area, Maybe you've heard the gospel a ton of times. Maybe you maybe you just really are not sure if God will accept you back, or maybe you've never done it. 
This morning as we sing, I'm going to challenge some of you to come forward and sell out to Christ Jesus.